Hi, everybody. My name is Leslie. Um, apparently, 75% of you are already thinking or about to put in a zero trust um, solution, although there's no such thing. I agree with a lot of what has been said here today. Um, but actually, then my work is done and I can go, right? Um, so I've been doing incident response for a very long time. Um, so I'm going to reflect really on uh, some of the things that have been said, maybe some of the things that we think from the point of view of Microsoft, but also because I don't just work with Microsoft, um, you know, when we get um, attacked, we like to say we're the second most attacked entity on the planet. Attempted attack, I just want to add, right? Because you know, our defenders are amazing. Eight and a half thousand of us, actually. Um, but anyway, uh, it's also when we work with externals who've been attacked. So if you um, noticed on some of the slides that have been shown, things like solar winds, um, fancy bear, cozy bear, you know, those are uh, incidents that I have actually slept on couches at. All right, this is why I look like I do today instead of, you know, actually I'm just 21. Um, I just age badly. Um, so the reality, um, having been doing incident response for 18 plus years, is, uh, is a perception thing. All right, control is very much around, I have control of this, it's in my data centers, on my perimeter, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm here to tell you that based on my experience, okay, polarized, I will grant you, given the fact that I only ever work in incident response, so whenever a company calls me, it's because they've been attacked, right? So polarized, not institutionalized, I just want to add. Um, but essentially, it's um, depending on which report that you read, you know, these guys have been inside networks for something like 240 days, it does depend. Um, but that is a really long time for these people to be there before we detect them, all right? And I think the power of the cloud and the scalability of the cloud today uh, gives us that um, potential to be able to very quickly detect what these bad guys are doing, all right? So, enduring myth that uh, I think, you know, it's inside my boundary, I can protect it, I know what I'm doing with it, uh, and yet today I think the gold standard of security is actually cloud-based services because of that power and scalability. Um, anybody want to disagree with me? We'll take it outside later, have a conversation. Um, I will also add that because uh, that because there are so many different things, I think you mentioned, um, uh, you know, detection solutions, we've got VPNs, we've got bastion firewalls, we've got, you know, all of these things that we uh, traditionally have spoken about that I think potentially gives us um, the point of having too many different toolings and trying to, uh, to stitch those things together. So whenever I'm um, an incident responder with a company, we will use whatever tooling the company has got to be able to stitch together what the attacker is doing. Uh, and one of the things that we talk about a lot is SIEM is dead, right? Long live SIEM. Um, because again, that XDR solution where we can bring these signals together um, essentially means that the SIEMs of the past, and if you ever remember, SIEMs were supposed to be the thing that saved us from a security perspective. Um, and again, forensically, the information's there, right? It's just that nobody's been able to do anything with it or there's been no automation. So, um, leads to us doing a lot of what we call swivel chair analytics, all right? Today, as they've already explained, you know, we've, um, we've moved beyond that. So essentially what we um, talk about from a zero trust perspective is securing the access at the resource. So our language has changed. I think the industry's language has changed. Again, um, thinking about trust but verify. Now we say never trust, always verify, but essentially for me it's about explicit uh, trust because one of the things, um, the knee-jerk reactions I've seen, I think, from organizations is that, oh, Big Brother's watching me as an employee, you don't trust me to do you know, the sensible thing, right? And I am not a proponent of blaming humans for this stuff, okay? Especially as Microsoft, we're a technology company, we speak very quickly about technology, but it's a people, process, and technology problem. So if we can stop blaming humans, um, because there's that lovely little cartoon about Dave in the corner, I don't know if you've seen it, we've got all of these controls, and we've got Dave over here doing this stuff. If we can get to the point um, where we can, uh, you know, stitch all of these things together, that the platform becomes transparent to what the end user does, he clicks on a phishing link, you know, it downloads a payload to the machine. Well, if we know that, for example, um, PowerShell.exe starts running from Outlook.exe. That's not a good thing, right? So we should already be blocking it at that point, and we should be using the compute power of the machine to be able to do that. I've worked out how this thing works. Um, so principles of zero trust. Uh, again, you can't go to somebody and, and ask them to give you a zero trust solution, right? Again, it's a framework and a mindset. Um, there is an architecture for it, which I'll show you, by the way. Uh, but essentially, there's these three things. We want you to verify explicitly. We want you to assume breach, because if you're thinking... Mm, 
about the fact that that's the worst case, the worst day of your life is you've got PII information having left the organisation. Uh, personally, I'm not a fan, again, of the word breach. I think it should be compromised because, you know, breaches of a portable offence, right? You have 72 hours to notify um, on GDPR. So assume compromise, but again, the worst day of your life is probably a breach has happened. So, so think about that. And then use least privileged access. So this, again, is not anything new, okay? This is something that we've been talking about, separation of roles for, for years, all right? Um, I will say some of the... Um, Figures that were showed a little bit earlier don't really reflect what we're seeing. So, for example, um, although there may be a desire to do zero trust, we are seeing that people aren't necessarily using multi-factor authentication. Um, and I think something like only 23% of administrators use multi-factor authentication. So, you know, this is something we've been on a journey for. So not less of the myth, right? More the concrete examples that we can share with you if you like. But... We started with identities. I think rightly so, because there's a little bit of a, a conflict in the uh, industry about the difference between do we do networking controls, do we do identities. If you think about what the attacker is doing, they are stealing their identities, right? We like to say they are logging on, not breaking in, right? Because again, big breaches of, of data sets, passwords, and um, usernames out there, we just replay those and we're inside in seconds, okay? Um, one of the key things that Brett Arsenal did for Microsoft was he got rid of passwords. So I haven't had to remember a password in two years, and he is our hero, right? Because they are just so um, old school. Um, of course, very easy to, re well, easy to remember, but easy to use, so they're going to proliferate for a while. But if we can get to the point where the technology no longer relies on passwords, oh, wouldn't that be Nirvana, right? And let's face it, you carry around with you some very much stronger authentication capabilities, you know, like your thumb, like your, um, you know, your facial recognition, that sort of thing, okay? Um, but we want to think about it from the point of view of all of these different six foundational models, right, which is, um, you know, all the way through identity, so whether your identities are carbon, whether they're silicon, uh, whether they're workloads, whether they're, you know, networking. So again, it's not to say that networking isn't important. It is but we want them to be integrated, all right? Um, the big change I'm seeing today is we start to talk about data, all right? And I am going to touch on ChatGPT and, and OpenAI in a little bit because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who are very interested in what, what we're doing in that space, okay? Um, but you've got to be thinking about all of this. So the problem then becomes how do we as defenders uh, prioritise where we're going to be putting our dollars, because that's what it comes down to, right? And maybe our resources as opposed to just straightforward money. Um, but there are some things that you can do from a low-hanging fruit perspective um, and thinking about balancing across the protect, detect, respond. Because uh, again, in my experience, lots of protection mechanisms out there, less focus on detecting and responding and actually containing. Uh, because again, incident responders don't do anything. I've got to come and do my investigation, find out what the attacker did, where he went inside the organisation so that we can make sure that when we um, expel the attacker, we've closed all the doors behind him, right? And yet, very frequently, we see that, that uh, what we're doing in terms of actually being able to recover the organisation requires modernisation, all right? Um, so again, if, there's, uh, if anybody wants some real-life um, stories around what I think you should be doing right now as opposed to spending a lot of money... Um, you know, trying to control or put controls in place. If that comes, speak to me afterwards. I will remove names to, to um, protect the innocent. Guilty. Um, so essentially, this is the architecture for zero trust. All right? um, it's underpinned really by uh, that continuous assessment. So whilst I think that pen testing um, has a place, right, uh, I do believe that if we are in a place where we can use that power of the cloud and the scalability of the cloud to be able to do that continuous monitoring piece, Fabulous, right? Why are we waiting until an attacker is actually using a vulnerability on a machine? Why aren't we, you know, notified that that machine has a vulnerability and proactively fixing it, okay? Uh, again, um, I'm going to touch a little bit on OT versus IT um, and what we're seeing from that space as well. Um, but essentially thinking about how you take all of that continuous assessment, um, infuse it with um, threat intelligence, and then what you come out the other side of it, right, with. Now, if you bear in mind, um, the proliferation of devices and things like IoT and that sort of thing means that we are literally in a data explosion. 
Um, we have got doubling, I think they're saying data's doubling every two years. All right, so I don't know about Moore's law, but <laughs> the data's gone mad. Um, we get something like 490 petabytes of information a day that comes into, into Microsoft. So you'll hear us talk about 75 trillion signals, you know. Uh, what does that actually mean? It means an awful lot of data. And how do we actually see what's happening inside that data? So once we've done all the, the gnarly things with um, AI, machine learning, over the top of that data, we get out the other side of that um, security data, something like four, four petabytes a day. All right, so if you want to put that into context, uh, NASA has something like 90 petabytes of Earth science data. Okay, Library of Congress has something like 40 petabytes um, of, of data that they use. So that's, you know, a lot of data. And where does it come from? It comes from all of our data centers, um, all of the uh, telemetry that we have based on the fact that we've got Bing, you know, Xbox, that sort of thing. By the way, gaming is obviously a big target for attackers, right? So we've got almost like a, a platform. You can see what the attackers are doing. Oh, it's great. Uh, yes, so that's kind of cool. Um, the key thing for the SASE slide I just want to point out is um, I've seen some tensions in the, in the field about the difference between SASE and Zero Trust. To me, there aren't. Um, there's no difference. It's just an overlay to Zero Trust if you're thinking about using that from a um, principles perspective. Uh, so SASE is the securing the access service edge. Everybody here heard of SASE? Good, lots of nods are moving on. Right, but just, just bear in mind that there's, uh, to me there isn't a conflict in that. That's certainly something that we can be talking about. Um, so again, I put some priorities uh, down on the slides, um, something that you can be thinking about doing from your own perspective. I'm not really going to walk through to, to it too much, but like I said, uh, we really think about user accounts, um, devices. And by the way, what we've seen the attackers do and what we're seeing um, the ability of co or what organizations want to do informs our build, buy, acquire, partner strategy, right? Um, because we, of course, are an engineering organization that does technology, so we're very keen to actually start building things, and very, very often we have to say, hang on a second, there's something better out there, all right? So an example will be um, proliferation of cloud identities that just went mad, right? The, the amount of permissions that I have as uh, somebody who's been working for Microsoft for a very long time, um, we bought Cloud Knox for that reason because of permissions creep, right? It's now part of an integrated defender for cloud. Um, Risk IQ, somebody that we worked with um, very heavily in uh, Hafnium, right? Uh, and they worked with the FBI as well. Can't beat them, you buy them, okay? Now part of the Microsoft um, suite. Uh, by the way, we were naming everything to Defender. As you all know, we're very prone to rename things based on what the uh, industry really needs us to be talking about. And the changing um, terminology that people use, and we, we, you know, we'll, we'll change based on that, but you know, my apologies, right? Oh, by the way, it's all going to be co-pilot next. Watch, watch this space. Um, operational technology, very different between OT and IT. I know that, but they're talking a lot about convergence um, between OT and IT. I personally think it's more of a convergence of signal. So that's what we do with our data centers. We get the signal in front of um, uh, a centralized pane of glass, if you like, and then ensure that that signal gets to the person who knows what to do with it. So it's pointless putting you know, um, a signal in front of um, maybe an IT person who doesn't understand what that OT technology is doing, but it jolly well helps very quickly if you can get somebody who's doing, um, you know, is maybe on the, the manufacturing floor, or whatever, to be able to do something very quickly with that. So again, one of the changes I'm seeing is away from passive technology, right, just show me if there's any detection or anything weird going on, to active technology, which is actively do something about it, provided you've got a human there in the loop to be able to push that button to say, go ahead, right? Um, so I mentioned the fact that they're inside the organization, organizations for upwards of 240 days. Um, this is a kill chain that we use internally. Uh, you notice the iconography on there. So one of the things that we find as the Cyber Defense Operations Center, which is the SOC that protects Microsoft, is very often we're in a position where um, SOCs only ever get talked to by the business because now you're in a, an incident, right? Why did you miss this bad SOC? Um, so what we found is that we can be proactively um, talking to the business around uh, what we see, what, what didn't we get hit with? What did other people get, um, get taken with? And this, by the way, is great from a gap analysis perspective. What don't we have from a technology perspective 
Could that technology have helped fix the problem? Do we need to, again, build, buy, create it, you know, partner with it? Okay? Um, but think of this as, as um, all of those different places that we potentially could have found what the attacker is doing. So if I speak to one of the seven red teams inside Microsoft that we have, right, 20 blue teams, seven red teams, um, you know, their uh, attitude is, well, you know, it's really difficult for us to not get de it detected, actually. So we've got to do all of this stuff and you guys just don't detect us, right? So again, that ability to be able to um, put those signals together, I think, is going to be key for us going forward. Again, in doing myth about Microsoft, we are not just Microsoft House. We have all the stuff, all right? We have a multi-cloud strategy. Uh, we work where we don't own the technology itself. We work with third-party um, providers to be able to bring the signals into the set as well, all right? And then we um, think about the era of the co-pilot, okay? So what is a co-pilot? Co-pilot essentially is a natural language capability that allows you as a person to be able to interact with um, that AI in a natural language way, like you would talk to your doctor or your, your tax accountant or whatever, right? Um, very uh, beguiling, right? Comes back as, as a very human interaction, right? I'm going to ask, who here hasn't used ChatGPT? Okay, so the vast majority of you haven't used ChatGPT. Everybody else who has used it are using it carefully, aren't we? Right? Because I like to liken it to a weather report. It's based on science, so it's great. But, you know, weather reports are not particularly accurate. Okay, stick your head out the window and you're going to get a different um, feel for what the weather is. So we've got to design for that tension between... Um, you know, what we, what we think it can do for us, and of course there's pros and cons with any new technology, um, but essentially thinking about the risks uh, as associated with things like ChatGPT, the fact that there's adversarial uh, machine learning going on, the fact that people are trying to poison the models. Um, one of the concerns, by the way, uh, deep fakes, we're going to see get much better because we can now interact um, ChatGPT with um, DALI, with Midjourney, you know, whatever, to be able to create something that's very... Uh, I don't know, it feels real, feels genuine. Um, the other concern uh, is as the open AI starts to increase, um, well, not just open AI, but you know, as the technology starts to then uh, reproduce uh, data into the field, you end up in this, this corpus of knowledge that potentially is just you know, AI generated and not necessarily based on the truth. So we then think about do we need to put watermarking in place so that the AI knows that it's actually generated by an AI so that it can, it can maybe give some... Um, grading uh, to that to that um, data that's out there. So these are all things that, that we're thinking about, um, and not just now, by the way, because we've been doing this since 2016, all right? So we have had uh, our ether group inside uh, Microsoft since 2016, who's really around what AI do you have inside your technology? What ML are you using? Are, are you doing it safely, responsibly? Um, can we work out whether or not that technology is something um, intelligibility is a word that we use, which essentially is how did that technology make that decision? Can we see as humans how it got to that conclusion um, and then basically just make sure that we are monitoring for that um, capability, right? Um, if you put the hyperscale infrastructure and then those models over the top of it from a security perspective, again inside the CDOC, we've been using um, this type of technology for, I want to say, four years, right? We announced Copilot, what? two months ago, something like that. Um, it's in process, obviously what we're doing now is working with, it's in very limited preview, we're working with design partners to, to work with it to make sure that we, um, when it gets released, because although we dog food it, uh, we need to make sure that it's um, ready for mainstream, uh, big time if you like, okay? Um, but essentially then this gives us the ability to um, use those playbooks to automate what it is that we're seeing. So we can reduce uh, essentially the time, the mean time to detect, the mean time to respond down to, um, you know, minutes, all right? And in fact, that's the motto for our CDOC is minutes matter because that's how quickly these guys can pivot and do something. Um, so, yes, do I think that um, AI ML uh, can save the world? <laughs> I kind of do, but I just think we want to be careful about it, all right? So one of the key things that we've um, said is that your data is your data inside your tenant. So if you're using chat GPT, um, open AI technologies, um, Synapse in Azure, that's inside your tenant, all right? We've got a very high security boundary we cannot see inside your tenant unless you let us in. We're a bit like vampires like that, right? 
Um, so if you overlay uh, the um, capability of, of what you're doing inside your tenant, um, I'll give you an example actually. Somebody said to me, um, can we run uh, Cuckoo Sandbox inside our tenant? And the answer is yes, you can do whatever you like inside your tenant provided you are not breaching the T's and C's for um, the Azure services or the M365 services that you signed up for. What we can see, however, is when attack traffic is leaving your organization, so don't use a tenant to pen test somebody else, okay? We won't like it, and we will do something about it. Um, right, if you decide that you're going to retrain the models to do something, um, as I mentioned, that, that um, those foundation models, whether they're large language models, whether they're multimodal language models, those become cheaper, um, faster, uh, hopefully safer, right? Um, and any of the co-pilots running over the top of that will benefit from those foundational models, all right? So that's how we see that, that playing out in, in future. Um, and that, because I just pushed the wrong button, is where you can find some more available resources, and that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>